Romany and Rack by G. Bramwell Evans. Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 11 The Crested Sentinel, April. It has always been an ambition of mine to photograph the plover or lapwing, as she is often called, on the nest. Jerry had promised to find one for me, and also to put up my hiding tent, so that I could snap her at close quarters. True to his promise, he sent me word that all was ready. I arrived at his cottage early in the morning, for one never knows how long such an adventure may take. You have left Brack behind, I see, said Jerry to me as I dumped down my paraphernalia. I nodded, and left him secure this time, I said, referring to the time when he had eluded those at home and followed me. Do you want to begin at once? Jerry asked, pointing at my camera. Not for an hour or so, I said, looking at my watch. The light is none too strong yet. That putting on of the clock makes a good deal of difference, you know. I've a nest or two you might like to see afore we go to Plovers. It's not very far to tent, he said. Could you do a bit of summer afore we set out? I shook my head. I've had a good breakfast, thank you, I replied, and I've a pocket full of fruit that will see me through the day. Jerry grinned. You're not grown very fat on them, I reckon. Oh, some ever, every man to his fancy. When we reached a beck which feeds the river, he took me to a small bridge. On the buttress was a large domed nest built of bents and moss. As I went nearer to it, a black bird, with a splash of white on its breast, dropped out of it, and uttering a cry of zit zit, winged its way with quick mechanical strokes further up the river. Dipper, I cried to Jerry, and putting my hand in the nest, I felt five eggs. I lifted one out very carefully and saw that it was pure white. No good decorating a thing you can't see, was Jerry's comment, and I knew that he was alluding to the fact that the eggs lay in darkness and were screened from view by its arched roof. Yon bird, said the poacher, has built them there for years. I ring the ancestral home of them dippers and those that has gone afore them. Last year it was almost in the same place, and just as I got up to it, out pop youngsters and flopped right down in water. Did they swim? I asked. Jerry shook his head. They did more than that, he said. The little beggars flopped down in water and walked on bottom of the stream and came out on the other side. I think I must have looked incredulous, for he continued, I wouldn't have believed it myself if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Of course, I've seen Odin's do it scores of times. But fancy them young uns having it in them to start with. That's why the nest are always built above water, I reckon, he added. But it isn't always built above the water, I said. And putting my hand in my pocket, I showed him a photograph I had taken a few days previously. As Jerry scrutinised it, I continued, I was visiting a friend whose house is built by the beckside. About ten feet from this stream is a passage, roofed in, as you can see, and half closed by a gate. That dark blob near the roof is a dipper's nest, so there's an exception to your rule, I added with a smile. It only goes to prove that birds is as queer as folk, said Jerry, handing me back my snapshot. There is all it is amongst them, just as there is amongst us. If them youngsters of yours which are actually in that nest drop down on them flags, they'll find it harder than water. There'll be some sore reds among them. Jerry was still walking on. I halted as I thought it was time I was making for the hiding tent, so we returned to his cottage, and having shouldered various packs, we turned our faces towards the upland meadows. The sun was shining brilliantly, though the wind, as we mounted higher, struck rather cold. Up a lane we wended our way, and on each side of the hedge birds were busy either searching for nesting material or for the flies and worms for which hungry mouths were waiting. There's a first swallow I've seen this year, I said, as a blue-black bird with widely forked tail sped by. 
Turn your money over for good luck then, said Jerry. Some folks take it out and spit on it as well. Though I don't know what good that does. As we turned the corner we heard the familiar cry of the plover, and a moment later the bird was flying overhead. There's the soaking all you see, said my companion. For sight and hearing I reckon them lacrims will take a lot of beating. He's sending down message to her on nest, telling her whether she's got to sit tight or else to hop it. Then we entered the field, and saw in the distance the rough sacking hiding tent that stood near to the nest. As we walked along, careful not to tread on any other eggs which might have been nestling on the ground, I noticed quite a lot of holes which looked to me either like nests ready for eggs or deserted ones. I pointed these out to Jerry. Them are scrapes made by the cock. He's making sometimes half a dozen or so, so that when he's found his partner, he can offer her a choice, and all we make in possession, said he. It's a wonder to me, I said, as we neared the tent, that those sheep and lambs don't walk through the nests and break all the eggs. Jerry stood still for a moment. They do break a goodish few, he said, but I'll tell you what I once saw. I was sitting down by edge, and in the field in front of me there were some plumber's nests. I could see the birds dozing quietly on them. Round about were a few sheep nibbling, and one I saw getting closer and closer to one of the nests. I thought that in a minute she's going to put her foot on sitting bird, but just as she come up to it the plumber pecked her on the tip of her nose. Jerry laughed at the recollection of it. I never saw a more surprised owl you in all my life. She turned tail and skedaddled down the field as though old Nick were at her. I reckon she'll be more careful when she's walking in future. I've often wondered whether sheep and cattle learn to give a sitting bird a wide berth, especially a plover, for she's plucky enough to tackle a wild elephant. At last I was safely housed in my small tent. Camera, plates, changing bag, lenses and my six-foot self were coiled up in three-foot square. For a few hours I had to be a tabloid. As Jerry walked away he called out, Good luck to you! And I knew that as he retreated the two birds before whose nest I had camped would be watching him from some concealed position. Three quarters of an hour passed and I whiled away the time of waiting by peeping through tiny spy holes listening to the sounds round about me. Over in the next field I could see a primary department of lambs. They were playing King of the Castle. Each member of the little group mounted onto a small knoll of green grass, and his other playmates then tried to butt him off his exalted position. Farther down the field I could see there's another peewit who is settling comfortably down on her eggs. As Jerry and I had passed this nest, I had put my head down and could distinctly hear the little birds cheeping inside. So the mother bird was anxious for them to break the shell. That was why she had returned as quickly as possible. As an accompaniment, I could hear blackbirds and thrushes challenging one another in song. From the hedge came the full-throated stanzas of the wren. Then the dunnock added his quick snatch of melody, as though he were anxious to sing the same verse as often as possible. Above me the lark was trilling as if he were inviting earth-bound mortals to come up into the blue and see how wonderful the world looked from such eminence. When I next looked at the nest in front of me, I found that the mother bird had stolen quietly onto it and was gazing intently at the big eye of the lens which poked itself through the front square of my sacking. Before I clicked the shutter and took her photograph, I gave her a chance to settle down. I then examined her carefully. What a poor description it is to describe her as black and white. On her wings is the sheen of the rainbow. Purple, blue, green give place to one another as varied shafts of light play upon them. Even her dark tail feathers are embellished with a streak of chestnut. The full lustrous eyes have in them the tenderness of the deer's gaze, while the crest which can be lifted or lowered at will sets off the dainty curve of the neck to perfection. To test whether she was bold or timid, I gently tapped my finger against the camera stand. She merely raised her crest and neck and looked fiercely at the tent. Then I released the shutter without actually exposing a negative, 
just to see whether she would flinch at such a noise. I was rejoiced to see that, though it startled her, yet she merely stood up over the eggs for a moment, as though debating whether she should quit or stay. However, she made up her mind that the duty must be done in spite of alarms, and once more she settled down and shuffled the eggs together, making sure that her small body left no egg exposed. And so, after a four hours' stay in the tent, and a number of hoped-for photos, I finally emerged and stretched my cramped limbs that were full of pins and needles. As I passed the other plover's nest, I found that the wee mites were hatched, and as soon as they saw me they squatted down like statues in the nearest hole they could find. As usual, the mother bird ran in front of me, doing the broken wing trick. Later, when I was telling Jerry over a cup of tea how I had spent my time, he said, Did you see that someone had sent to the king a couple of the first plover's eggs where they'd been found? But the taking of the eggs is illegal, I said. The bird is such a friend for the farmer that she is protected by law. That's just what the king said, Jerry answered appreciatively. He looked to the sender, telling him he'd got them all right, but that he couldn't receive them. Well, he said, raising his teacup, here's a good health to his majesty. And also to the little bird, the friend of farmers and kings, I said, and we clinked our cups together.